This symposium and CCU itself are committed to engaging what allows human beings to flourish as God intended. And although some of you probably came here expecting to hear something like, don't do it now and wait till marriage, I'm here to introduce a speaker whose career and view of relationships will dramatically upset your expectations. Dr. Dale Keene got his PhD from Georgetown University in political science and received a master's in church history from Gordon-Conwell Seminary. His perspective does call us to a higher standard, but it challenges tradition just as much as our present cultural consensus. But it challenges more than tradition. His melding of political and religious perspectives began in his education, but it is continued throughout his life. But it's not just disciplines that he crosses. Although in 2001 he was ordained and he has served as pastor of Emmanuel Covenant Church while simultaneously teaching political theory at St. Anselm College and founding the New Hampshire Institute of Politics, and he, although he doesn't really claim to be artistic, Dr. Keene's recent book, Sex and the Eye World, shows a masterful use of poetry and pop culture to illustrate both where we are and why it's failing. He's a constructive social critic and a professor with a pastor's heart. As the late Chuck Colson's review put it, direct, challenging, and ultimately compassionate. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Reverend Dr. Dale S. Keene. Thank you so much, Hudson, for that kind introduction. Um, I'm delighted to be here this morning. I wasn't sure yesterday whether I'd be able to be here given flights and stuff, but I'm here and I'm glad. Um, I want to say a bit about uh, what I want to do in the two sessions we have together. I want to talk in the first section, a session about this question of sexual ethics or sexual theology. And in the second session, I want to talk about the issues of identity. And I would argue that in the day in which we live, sexuality, sexual ethics um, is a huge issue that we face. And this whole question of who are we, our identity, how do we know who we are is another big issue. So those are the two things I want to talk about. It's in a topic like this, it just begs questions. And what I've, I've been invited to come back in November um, to speak in chapel. So unless I say something that uh, gets me disinvited, um, I'll be back in November and I'd love to do a, a talk back session. I'd love to have a time where you just, we can just talk about questions and answers. Because if I say what you expect me to say today, you'll have questions. If I don't say what you expect me to say today, you'll probably have questions. And the, the most important discussions we need to have are about those questions. Um, when people hear about my background, they have lots of questions. Why is this ordained evangelical minister teaches politics at a Catholic school in New England? How can this possibly be? And um, I've gone around a fair bit of the world, and I've never actually met anybody else who was an ordained professor of politics. So I tend to live a pretty lonely life. The things I'm most interested in, religion and politics, no, nobody really wants to talk about. So I sit at home, wait for the phone to ring, <laughs> figure out that my phone number is probably unlisted and it just doesn't work. Um, I'm a little bit about me. I'm married. I've been married to Rachel for 34 years. I have three children. Naomi, Leah, and Ryan, 31, 29, 27. So yes, I am old enough to be your grandfather. And you'll see me drinking tea occasionally. This is not for dramatic effect or to be cool. Um, I had thyroid cancer many years ago, and in the process of my thyroid cancer, I lost the vocal cords. So I only have one vocal cord. For the physiologists in the room, you'll ask the question, well, then how can you speak? because you can't speak with one vocal cord. But a physician at Dartmouth University fashioned an artificial vocal cord out of Gore-Tex, the raincoat material. So because of that, I actually can speak, but I don't have any saliva glands for the most part. So that's why I drink from time to time. So the question of sexuality, the question of our day. Why is it that anybody in their right mind would talk about that issue when we all realize it's just a net loser? 
that in the day in which we live, you open up your mouth to talk about sexuality and you're going to get attacked from the left and you're going to get attacked from the right. You're going to get attacked from your parents. You're going to get attacked this way and that way. My mom is 85 years old. She, um, her father graduated from Moody Bible Institute, so you would understand that I come from a conservative type family, but my mom, every time on the telephone, asks me the question, Dale, are you on the wrong side of history? Thanks, Mom, thanks. <laughs> so at 56, I'm still having mother issues. <laughs> but the question is one that's on all of our minds. Are we on the wrong side of history? And given um, the history of America with race, particularly with slavery, being on the wrong side of history and recognizing that Christians very thoughtfully were on the wrong side of history gives all of us pause because none of us want to be on the wrong side of history. Why would I be up talking about it? As the introduction said, I am um, teach at St. Anselm College. For those of you that watch West Wing or politically um, interested, you'll know that the New Hampshire primary is the first primary in the presidential selection process. And because of that, all the presidential candidates come to our New Hampshire multiple times. St. Anselm in Manchester, New Hampshire is in the epicenter of uh, geographically New Hampshire. So after a couple of us arrived at uh, St. Anselm in 1994, after the first primary cycle, we realized this was awesome. In Minnesota, where I grew up, there wasn't any presidential candidates that ever came. And I had all the candidates in my classes, Bill Clinton in my class. And so we established something called the New Hampshire Institute of Politics. I had the opportunity to be the executive director, and it was like I was a kid in a candy shop. What could be better? Host nationally televised debates, host presidential candidates, um, have media come interview me about this and that. Everything fed my ego. I was having a great time. And members of the media knew that I was one of the only religious people that they had met, um, that they knew. So for some, I was Father Dale. Others, I was Rabbi Dale. Um, they'd often come to me about sound bites for religion. And then one day, the Massachusetts Supreme Court issued a ruling that said that the Massachusetts Constitution allowed for same-sex marriage. So the press was at my door asking me, what do you think about that? And I said to myself, and I said to the reporter, I'm not from Massachusetts, and I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> and shortly thereafter, the Episcopal Church in New Hampshire ordained uh, Bishop Eugene Robinson, the first openly gay bishop in the worldwide Anglican communion that set off the firestorm that'll lead to its ultimate division. And the press was at my door again and said, what do you think? And I said, I'm not Episcopalian and I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> and that's where I had my crisis of faith. If I wasn't ordained, I'm quite sure I would never have talked about it. But because I have this reverend in front of my name, I felt like if I'm not willing to speak to the issues of the day, I might as well just turn in my ordination. So I got an invitation one day to be on New Hampshire Public Radio and do a public forum with Bishop Robinson on the issue of same-sex marriage. And they asked me to open, and I talked for about two minutes about why I didn't think the scripture supported same-sex marriage. And Bishop Robinson says, I couldn't agree with Reverend Keene more. And I'm saying, whoa, I persuaded him. <laughs> and he says, the Bible doesn't support same-sex marriage, but neither does the Bible oppose it. The Bible's not a book about history, it's not a book about science, it's not a book about this, it's a book about love and grace. And so he definitely moved the discussion off scripture to this kind of never, never world of love and grace, and for the next 90 minutes, people called in asking me why I was such a bigot. So I said, I'm not going to do that again, which leads me to, in a certain sense, why I'm here. What I realized was I didn't have the language to speak to the world in which I live, what I believe to be true, which is the Christian teaching about sexuality as gospel or good news. And I decided that I wasn't going to speak to the issue again until I could figure out not what I was against, but what I was for, and that I could look people in the eye and say, I believe that the Christian teaching about sexuality, or the Orthodox teaching, um, is good news, recognizing that almost nobody I ever talked to um, will agree with me, recognizing that there's almost nobody I ever talked to I will persuade, but that I needed to have that internal sense about 
what I believed and why. And I also needed to figure out what changed in this world. When I was born in Minneapolis, Minnesota in 1958, this wasn't even on the um, same-sex marriage and all the, diff all the changes with we've sexuality. It wasn't even in the landscape. In 1978, I was at Wheaton College in Illinois. I went to a psych professor, asked him what should I study for my paper. He looked at me and he said homosexuality. And I said, why? And he said, because it'll be the issue in the 21st century. And I had to go back to my room to look up what it meant. The world has changed so dramatically. And there was a time in which people were interested in what Scripture said. There was a time in which people were interested in a debate about dialogue. But we live in a moment now in which the culture has lost confidence that what the Scripture has to say is good news. And it's not just the culture that has lost the confidence, it's the Christian church. The Christian church has lost confidence in the idea that what the scripture has to say about sexuality is good news. And the reality is, is that the behavior of Christians and non-Christians um, pretty, is pretty similar when it comes to sexual, sexuality, divorce, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so it's not just a question of, quote, the culture or the world. And, and I can't, you know, I've never been to CCU before, and depending on what happens today, I may never be back, but, <laughs> but it's the case that if you, we polled uh, um, CCCU schools, the Christian College Coalition Universities, if we polled the students, the students um, at these schools in, are in favor of same-sex marriage, uh, cohabitation, a wide variety of things. I mean, I, can't, I have no idea where you all stand in those surveys, but the reality is, is that Christians under the age of 30 have a profoundly different understanding of those of us over the age of 55. And those between the age of 30 and 55 are somewhat ambiguous, trying to figure out what to do, and if people are conflict-averse, trying to figure out how never to talk about it. And so the question is, as we sit here today, is that Christian teaching about sexuality is it good news? Do you, we believe it, or don't we? I don't come today as a Bible scholar with a new reading of Scripture, but I do want to do an examination and ask this question, is the Christian teaching about sexuality good news? Now, the world in which we presently live is no longer the world of the Ten Commandments. It's not a world that is rooted in any kind of a sense of absolutes for the most part. It's not a, a world that has a, either a, a traditional worldview, a classical worldview, a Christian worldview. It's really a postmodern world. And the world in which we live, I've come to the conclusion that it's not the Ten Commandments that um, govern us, it's something I call the three taboos. And they go as follows. Do whatever you want, so long as you don't hurt anybody. And do whatever you want, so long as you don't hurt anybody. Second taboo, you can do whatever you want with somebody else so long as it's consensual. If it's consensual, we applaud. If it's not consensual, go to jail. The third taboo, don't you dare tell anybody else that their moral choices are wrong or the fury of hell will come upon you. Do what you want so long as it's consensual. Do what you want so you don't cause harm. Do not judge. And so to live in this world that we live in today, it's one thing to be able to articulate what you believe, but as a student mentioned at a Harvard commencement one day, at Harvard we're taught that we can believe anything that we want so long as we don't assert that it's true. We're told that we want to tolerate all beliefs but every belief is relative to the self. Don't you dare assert that there's something that's absolute. Don't you dare assert that there's something that is true. What's true for you may not be true for me. And it certainly plays in this area of sexual ethics. Do what you want. Do whatever you want so long as you don't cause harm sexually. Do whatever you want with whomever you want 
so long as it's consensual. Don't tell anybody else that their choices in the area of sexuality is wrong. We not only live in a time of the three taboos, we live in a time in which we think about freedom in a very different way. There was a time in the United States and in the, in the West in which we said freedom was, freedom was when you acted to do the right thing. So freedom of speech meant the freedom to be honest, the freedom to be, speak the truth, but never the freedom to slander. So freedom had a moral component. We don't live in a time where if we understand freedom as having a moral component, it's what we might, the philosophers would call negative freedom, freedom from. And in the world in which we live, I believe that we want freedom from authority. We want to tear down every authority other than the self. We don't want anybody else to tell us what to do. We live in a time in which we want freedom from want. We're not a group of people that's very self-restrained. We want what we want, when we want it, now. We want it now. We don't want authority, and we want freedom from want. If we want to have certain appetites fed, then we want the freedom to do them now, and we want freedom from nature. Rather than seeing the nature as something that can guide us and shape us and inform us as to who we are, we're pushing back the boundaries of nature. We're using medicine, we're using science, we're using everything we possibly can to push back the boundaries so that we can become whatever it is that we want to become and that there's nothing that will constrain us and we live in this world that worships at this altar of the I, this I world, this world of freedom, this world of um, license and the sexual ethic is simply do what you want so long as you don't cause harm, so long as it's consensual and CCU students, don't you dare tell anybody else they're wrong. If you want to think what you think, it's fine, but don't you do that. And my sense is, is that this way of thinking has captured the day. Now, you may be asking yourself later, well, who is this guy who is so depressing? <laughs> and I just, you just need to know I come from New Hampshire New Hampshire is um, always in competition with Maine as the least church state in the country. Um, we're, we have less than 10% of people in New Hampshire go to any house of worship on a Sunday. The average size of a church in New Hampshire is 70. 65% um, of us pastors are bivocational. So if I say in Colorado, I'm a full-time pastor and a full-time professor, people wonder, if, you know, what am I on? In New Hampshire, it's not that hard because the churches aren't that large. Christianity is an endangered species, and we live in a very post-Christian world. So are we on the wrong side of history when it comes to sexuality? Rather than talk about the Bible for the next few minutes, I want to talk about a dead Greek guy, Aristotle and see what you think. And the operative word is think. Aristotle argues that humans are by nature social, relational. Now we live in a culture that's very individualistic. Uh, the, the image of America is kind of the rugged individualist. When I think of the West, I think of the rugged individualists. And individualism is not a bad thing. It's a very important part of, I think, culture, human freedom. But at the same time, what Aristotle is saying is the only way we can find fulfillment in life is we can't find it by ourselves. We're going to find it in relationship. We're by nature social. And he says that there's three primary relationships that are essential for human flourishing for human happiness, and what Aristotle says is everything I'm about to tell you, you can just use your brain with, you don't have to be a Christian or not, and Aristotle's going to say in the next 25 minutes, I'm going to show you the truth. Aristotle says the first primary relationship is family. Now, why does he say that? And family is probably not nuclear family, it's a more extended family. 
What he says is, is that human beings, we can't conceive of ourselves. We can't get to know ourselves without being part of a family. All of us are born. All of us are born into a family. And what Aristotle says is, is that family shapes us in a profound way. Family shapes each and every one of us in a profound way. And the quality of our life is directly related to the quality of our family. Now, when I go around and speak to college students and say that phrase, the quality of our life is related to the quality of family, you can just see eye contact move away. You can see pain in people's lives because so many of us come from dysfunctional families. So many of us come from broken families. So many of us come from families of divorce, or if not divorce, families that are really dysfunctional, and family causes a lot of pain. So does Aristotle say that if our family life is painful, the life is not worth living? No. What he says is we need to pay attention to something. Family is irreplaceable. The quality of our life is related to the quality of our family. If we find ourselves in families that are broken and can't be fixed, what we need to realize is, is that going forward in our life, the quality of our life is going to be related to the quality of our family life. And if we can't, maybe we can't fix our family of birth, but we, can, we need to pay attention to the family we create because marriage and family is an important part of human fulfillment. Second relationship calls the neighborhood. And this is the most boring part of this whole presentation. The neighborhood is just the constellation of families that live in proximity to each other. In New Hampshire, uh, Robert Frost, as our poet laureate, he has this phrase, tall fences make good neighbors. But what Aristotle is saying is that if you live in a neighborhood where people look out after each other, where people care for each other when they're sick or infirmed or on vacation, where you can trust your kids with each other, if you live in a good neighborhood, it contributes in a significant way to the quality of your life, and it's so significant nothing can take its place. And if you live in a neighborhood where there's crime, where you fear for your safety, your family, you're worried about your property and all those kind of things. It impacts the quality of your life. And it's usually the case when I go talk to people that people haven't thought a lot about family, but when you look at the reason why people buy the houses they do where they buy it, it's pretty clear that whether people are conscious of it or not, they recognize neighborhood matters. People immediately think of the neighborhoods they want to live in and the neighborhoods they don't want to live in. And there's usually pretty significant agreement about it, whether you can afford it or not. By the way we live our lives, we recognize the quality of our life is related to the quality of our neighborhood. Third relationship, city. The quality of our life is related to the quality of our city. And why is that? The city's the place where there's specialization. There's people that can make clothes. There's people that can fly airplanes. There's people that hopefully will deliver baggage. There's people that can, <laughs> there's people that will make food. There's, all, there's education, music. There's all these things. And what Aristotle says is, the family provides something that's essential and good. It's irreplaceable. The neighborhood provides something essential and good, and the city provides something essential and good. There's a difference between living in Denver and Beirut, and there's a difference between living in Kabul, Afghanistan, Manchester, New Hampshire. The quality of our city life matters. Aristotle has something else to say. The city has a quality about it. It needs to be large enough so that you can have all your needs met, small enough so you can know everyone. Large enough to have your needs met, small enough so you can know everyone. Now, why would that be? My family comes from Long Prairie, Minnesota, about 2,000 people near Lake Wobegun in central Minnesota, and in Minnesota, if we all live together in Long Prairie, Minnesota, and you represent over half the population of the city as we presently sit here, if you were to walk down the street and see me in the gutter drunk, 
Aristotle asked the question, if you, we lived in Long Prairie together and you saw me drunk, would you walk by and leave me in the gutter? Or would you take me, pick me up, drag me home to Rachel and say, keep him out of, off the streets, he's a blight on our town. And Aristotle says, if we lived in Long Prairie, Minnesota, we would take me home. But what if we lived in New York City? What if you're walking down the street in New York City and you find somebody in the gutter like me, do you stop? Aristotle says, rationally, everybody in the room right now is making the same calculation, and the calculation is don't stop. Not because you're a bad person or you're a bad Christian. You don't stop because if you stop, take care of me, bring me somewhere, go back to the place on the street and walk another block, you're going to find somebody else that there's no possible way you can take care of the needs that you will encounter every day on the street. And so as a result of that, if you live in New York City, you will not make eye contact. You will spit on cabs. You will do all sorts of things. And you will, in a certain sense, dehumanize yourself to not be as sensitive to the needs of your fellow human beings. And the problem is, at the end of the day, you go home. You walk down your street going home. Is your neighbor likely out in the yard wanting to talk to you? If your neighbor's out in the yard, do you notice them? You go up to your apartment. You open the triple, triple locks on your apartment. You go in. You see the wife. You see the dog. You see the kids. Do you say, hi, honey, I had a great day. How was your day? I'd love to hear about it. Let's talk. Or do you walk on by, go sit down, decompress a half hour later, come out of your stupor and say, Rachel, where were you? I didn't notice. What Aristotle says is that our relationships shape us. Where we live in family, neighborhood, city, they shape us. So now you're saying they brought this guy all the way from New Hampshire to talk about sex. What a bad deal. Haven't mentioned it. Fourth relationship. Friendship. Aristotle said there's something really important that comes in these three relationships I've just mentioned. They're relationships of obligation. Sometimes you'll, ask, you'll say to yourself in regard to your family, your neighborhood, your city, you'll say, I didn't ask to be born. I'm going to have to make the best of a bad situation. There's sometimes, my kids tell me, even today, we didn't ask to be born. And I look at my kids and I say, well, I prayed for kids, but I didn't get the kids I prayed for. In relationships of obligation, we're supposed to take care of each other. It's a command. You, this is what family does. This is what neighborhood does. This is what city does. You take care of each other. And the brilliant part of those three relationships, if people are functioning, is that there's no way to fall through the safety net. Everybody's taken care of. But there's a fundamental question that every human being has that can't be answered in those relationships. And the question is, if anybody really knew me and they didn't have to love me, would they? If anybody really knew me and they didn't have to love me, would they? Aristotle says that's one of the most important questions that we are asked, and that's a question that's answered in friendship. A friendship is a relationship where we love another person for who they are, and there's no contract. And they love us for who we are. There's no contract. And it's in this friendship that we can learn that we can be loved for who we are despite ourselves. Not because anybody has to relate to us, but because they can. They want to. They choose to. And he says if we have two or three good friendships in our lifetime, we are blessed indeed. But there's a final relationship. Aristotle says, even if you have all these things, this is the last one, even if you have all these things, there's something that's missing. What Aristotle says is there's nothing.